tonight's speaker. In philosophy, Dr. Trent Doherty specializes in the theory of evidence. He wrote his doctoral dissertation with the world's leading evidentialist. He edited evidentialism and his discontents with Oxford University. He wrote the entry on evidence for the Oxford Annotated Bibliography, has published articles on evidence in several scholarly journals, including the European Journal of Philosophy, and is currently editing the Rutledge Handbook of Evidence. Here is a complete list of Dr. Doherty's publications to date. <laughs> on the table, here is a stack of books which Dr. Do Doherty has either written, edited, or contributed to. Speaking tonight to the topic religion, irreligion, and stupidity, please welcome Dr. Trent Doherty. Thanks, Ezra. Thanks to all of you who are here locally at Dichotomy, and thanks to all of you who are watching on the live stream on the Facebook page. <clears throat> also want to welcome my family here. Raise your hands, family. And uh, also, thanks to my second family in my home away from home, which is Dichotomy. Uh, much of what I've written was written right here uh, at all hours of the morning and night. And uh, it would be, it's important to support uh, the, our host, so make sure you order something. If you don't have anything in your hand, fix that before the night's over. Get something to drink, whether, whether it's on one side of the dichotomy or the other. <clears throat> this time of night, I recommend the second side of the dichotomy. Um, I'm probably more nervous about this talk than I have ever been in any talk in 20 years of public speaking. And I've spoken in faraway places like Helsinki, hoity-toity places like Oxford University, and exotic places like Iran. And in those venues, it's no problem because they don't know I'm a fraud. When you're addressing people in your own backyard, your home away from home, you know that people know you're just a schmuck with a laptop and an email address. They see me on any given day or night here, including until 1 a.m. last night. Um, and it's clear that I am not in any sense of the word, a role model for faith. On the contrary, everything that I've written on faith and reason and the relationship between them has grown out of my own questioning of myself and my beliefs and the world that I live in. I'd be remiss if I didn't stop again to mention on the 15th anniversary, the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and other, um, and other targets. Uh, my oldest daughter is 17, and so 15 years ago she was two. I was teaching at the time Latin and Greek in a high school similar to Waco's Live Oak, and I was in one of the, those trailers that's behind uh, schools, and in the, in the trailer next door to me, they were watching a video, and somebody, I could tell there was a stir, there was a lot of noise next door, and so I went over, and I said, what, what's going on over here? And they had just heard about the attacks, and they had taken the TV that they were showing the video on, hooked it up to an antenna to get the local TV station, and they were watching the aftermath of the first impact. And so together with my juniors and junior and senior uh, Latin class, my medieval Latin class, we sat there and watched in horror and disbelief. And as we watched live, the second impact occurred. And as we watched live, the first building collapsed. And as we watched live, the second building collapsed. It's indelibly marked in my memory forever, as is the explosion of the space shuttle Challenger when I was a child, our principal came in and announced that it had, it had exploded. It affected 
my life with my children because we tried to shield them from the images on television. My daughter, too at the time, very precocious and intelligent, wanted to know about why are there all the ribbons on the trees. People, at the time, people were putting yellow ribbons around trees in their yards as uh, an act of solidarity and remembrance for the victims. And she would say, Daddy, Daddy, um, Daddy, bow, bow on tree. Why bow tree? And it was just impossible to explain to her at that time what that was all about. Nevertheless, even given all of my attempts, pay attention, <laughs> even given all of my attempts to shield her from those images, one day, maybe a month later, when we went by another yellow ribbon on a tree in the park, she says, Daddy, sometimes airplanes fall down. It was very, very tough to... to the, the, the event in all its horror was more poignant in trying to think about how to relate that to a two-year-old. And we should pause and remember that today. So it's my belief that everything that we believe and everything that we do is affected by every experience that we have or nearly every experience we have, that there are no or very few experiences that have no impact on what we believe and what we do. I'm taking a picture of y'all. How about that? I might even take a selfie. Here you go. Everybody wave. And so there's a certain respect in which every story is autobiography. So the most important part to me of tonight's event is the question and answer, both up here at the mic for the live studio audience, but also for the people who are uh, watching the live feed and who can submit questions via Facebook or Twitter. But I want to at least give you a little bit of my personal story, both because that colors everything that I believe and do, and so that you can understand a little bit where, where I'm coming from. So I was born in rural northwest Missouri, literally in a cornfield. Well, I mean, like my mom didn't give birth to me in a cornfield, but our house was literally in a cutout of a cornfield. And my little tiny school, where you had first and second grade in one class, and third and fourth grade in one class, and fifth and sixth in, another, in a class, where my graduating junior high class was 14 people, was literally in a cutout in the corner, like a postage stamp in the corner of a section of land that was nothing but yellow corn one year and, and uh, soybeans the next year. Extremely rural environment. The closest town was St. Joseph, Missouri. The official Chamber of Commerce slogan for St. Joseph, Missouri is St. Joe, where the Pony Express began and Jesse James ended. Because it's literally the place where the Pony Express stables were. It was the gateway to the Wild West and it's literally the place where Jesse James had his bl brains blown out in a house downtown. And of course, as a school child, every year we would take field trips to the Pony Express uh, Museum and stables and see all about the, how the stables work and about the Pony Express. And we would also go to the, to the house and see the, the bullet hole that was still in the wall where, the, where it, it exited Jesse James's forehead. So I grew up in a very rural environment one that was imbued with a lot of um, Wild West mentality and violence and in a very, uh, very hyper-masculine sort of environment. My, uh, I was not raised with any religious background whatsoever. Uh, both of my parents had very strict religious upbringings that led them to reject that and walk away from that. So I was raised in a completely religiously vacuous environment. Religion, so far as I could tell, did not impinge upon my life in the least bit up until about age 13. At that point, already burned out from uh, living fast in an attempt to die young, I met some friends, some girls that had just come to the school that I was going to, and they were Christians, 
or as I put it, Jesus freaks. And I did not understand what they were saying. I literally, I'm, that's not hyperbole. They would, they would say things and I would not understand what they meant. I remember we were walking through their house and there were all sorts of religious articles. There were Bibles on the table, pictures of Jesus, verses on the fridge. And I said, bummer, man, your parents must be religious. And they're like, well, we've accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. And I didn't freak out because I didn't have any concept of what that could possibly mean. It was just words. It was just words that had no real meaning for me whatsoever. But the family was nice to me. And things sort of were rough at home. I ended up staying with them, living with them for a period of time. And they would always invite me to church Sunday and Wednesday. And they'd say, we're going to church. You want to come? And I'd say, no, that's fine. You just enjoy yourselves. Um, they'd say, okay, we'll be back. Make yourself comfortable. And so I think Wednesdays was spaghetti, and I forget what they had when, we got, when they got back from church on Sunday. But it was the same thing. It was always a Sunday meal and a Wednesday meal, and it would be the same, th same thing every time. We're going to church, you want to come? Nope. Okay, we'll see you when we get back. So there was no pressure on me to go. Their love for me was unconditional. Their support for me was unconditional. And so one time I thought, well, I'll throw these guys a bone. They're being pretty nice to me. So I'll go to their little church thing, make them feel good. And so I went, and it would be wrong to say that it, it didn't, that it didn't, that it wasn't what I expected, because I didn't, I didn't know what to expect. I guess I had minimally expectations of it being extremely awkward and weird. And it was maybe, but not, a, not at all in the way that I, I expected. They were just other people who were also very nice and accepting. And so I thought, well, that wasn't so bad. Um, and it was halfway fun. So I'll, I'll maybe go back sometime. Well, I did go back. And then some months later, I had the born again experience. And this church was, um, it was a Nazarene church, but it was a Nazarene church that was kind of charismatic in a way. And it was on um, North 9th Street in downtown St. Joe, next to an abandoned hospital that was just crumbling to the ground with boarded up windows. Very poor part of town. 10th and Lincoln. It was on the corner of 10th and Lincoln. North Side Nazarene. Very, very blue collar area. area. Very depressed area. In the winter, the population of the church would almost double from the street people coming in to get warm. But again, no real pressure on me to be something other than I was, but I did begin to change. So then I switch high schools and I start getting interested in, more interested in philosophy and um, started having nagging doubts about these things that were proposed for me to believe. I had some teachers who were devotees of Bertrand Russell and A.J. Ayer, and they would really question me about my faith and what I believed. And I enjoyed this a lot. I enjoyed it a ton. But it engendered a lot of questions. But the doubts were not so much intellectual as they were emotional. There was this, there was this sort of mocking voice. It was like, what if you're, like when I would try to pray, and I do mean try, because nobody ever taught me how to do this stuff. I did not grow up religious. I had no concept. The first time, when I got my first Bible, and like I thumbed through it and saw there was a book of Job, I thought it was like, I called it Job. I saw the book of Acts, and saw Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2. I thought it was a play. I thought it was Act 1, Act 2, Act 3. I knew nothing about the Bible, nothing about church history. So I would try to pray, and then there would be this nagging voice. What if you're just sitting in this room alone, talking to yourself? And the contrast between what I was told I was doing and this, and this possible reality couldn't be more stark. On the one hand, there's the idea that you are in personal communion with the creator of the universe, 
And then on the other side is the possibility that you were a deluded fool sitting in your room talking to yourself. That's a massive, massive difference. And for me and my personality and my obsession with evidence and confirmation and love of science and mathematics, I had to, I had to investigate the grounds for these beliefs. And I had to investigate the relationships between different beliefs. I could not separate these religious beliefs from my scientific beliefs and beliefs about history and other things. Nobody was pressuring me to do this necessarily. I was just incapable of holding separately these two different things as if they were two different worlds that had to be kept apart and couldn't go together. If they didn't go together, something had to go. If they didn't go together, something had to go. Now, what one thing that did go was a certain sort of naive belief that was part of that evangelical milieu of that place and of that time. My beliefs matured, transformed, changed, changed in ways that made me an outsider to that original community, changed in ways that made me not have a, a home for my beliefs or spiritual journey. And the family that had been taking care of me moved. I moved with them. And they were next to a Baptist church. And so they started going to the Baptist church. So I started going to the Baptist church. And long story short, I got really interested in like hardcore Bible study because it it satis- the sort of detailed examination of the text appealed to a certain part of me that ended up being manifest in academic scholarship. The breaking down and logic and meaning of a text very much appealed to me. So, so I got caught up in that. <laughs> I, was even <laughs> I was even ordained a Southern Baptist minister. Um, and so I went off to seminary. And the, the world of seminary was kind of a disaster. Um, it was a disaster because there was this big divide between the theologians, the theology track people, and the pastoral track people. The pastoral track people were like, we don't need any of your fancy ideas and beliefs. Christianity isn't about beliefs. It's about your heart and what you do. And then the theologian track people, the theology track people were like, um, you know, you guys go off and do your little social work and we'll do the real work of figuring God out. So there was a real divide there and I did not like that divide. That divide did not jive with me. The divide did not work for me. The theology had to justify the action and the action had to be consistent with the theology or I was out the door. And so that's what happened. I was out the door. And when, so, so then I left seminary. I went back to the University of Missouri, was a, a physics, philosophy, and religious studies uh, joint major. Um, I joked that I actually double majored in philosophy because I had more than twice as many hours as it took to get a major in philosophy. I took every philosophy class that came up during the six and a half years of my undergrad. I squeezed, I squeezed four years into six and a half because I, I loved philosophy so much. I took every philo- basically every philosophy class that came up while I was an undergraduate. I just took it. I just automatically signed up for every one. And I especially gravitated towards logic. That was the thing that I absolutely loved was logic. And I liked the formality of it, and I liked the way that it was a tool of inquiry for examining the relationship between different beliefs and especially the support for different beliefs. How did my foundational beliefs provide a support for these religious beliefs? From there, I ended up going to an Episcopal church and then I, I, I realized that I needed to be in some sort of apostolic communion. I thought, I needed to be more grounded in history, and so it was either Eastern Orthodoxy or Catholicism, 
And I, I dedicated so many years to reading through the, the canons of the councils and, and trying to, to figure out which way I should go. And one day I decided, I announced to all my friends, my, my search is over, I'm going Eastern Orthodox. And then six days later I started RCIA in the Roman Catholic Church. Um, I love the Orthodox tradition. I love um, Eastern... I love the Eastern Church. I, I, I think that the Western Church, I think Catholicism needs to really mine the, the resources of the Eastern Church. Um, and I still have an incredibly great love for, for the Orthodox Church. But I ended up Roman Catholic, which, which was such a huge surprise because when I was a Baptist, we were literally taught it was a cult. And so here I... And so, so in, in certain respects, there's a sort, sort of continuity to the story. There's a sort of continuity to the beliefs that I started out with and that I ended up with. And yet, um, it's also some massive differences. So different that like when I, when I became Roman Catholic, my Baptist friends, like some of them literally cut me off, like would not talk to me. I would walk into Shakespeare's Pizza and where we used to hang out and they would, it was just one of those like... I was, I was out of fellowship. I was persona non grata. And so, and, and then even as a Catholic, even as a Roman Catholic, it's, it's a journey. And there's diversity within there. And I'm not a good Catholic. I'm not a good Christian. And it's not just something you say because you're supposed to say it. It's a fact. It's a fact. I am no model of faith for anybody unless you're also struggling because the only thing I've ever done in my life is struggle with questions and just do what I can to figure it out. I am not certain of anything. There are no certainties in my system. Every, this... this tattoo right here, symbol, it's a cross made out of an unfolded die, and it represents the interplay between faith and doubt and providence and chance. Everything in my life is subject to some doubt, some questioning. There are no closed questions for me, and I don't think they, there ever will be closed questions for me. So... Ezra, in his introduction, talked about my graduate school experience. Then Baylor recruited me out of graduate school. I came here, really fell in love with the place, with a great philosophy department in the, in the Brazos River area in the Bluffs, and I live up in Cameron Park in the Bluffs, and I just love Waco. I really do. And I'm very glad to live here, have wonderful graduate students, have this wonderful place, dichotomy, to, to do my work in, and the university down the river. But it was, some, it was a bit of a long, strange trip to get here. And, and, there's, and my journey's not over. My journey's far, far from over. So that's the background from which I'm coming. And... Everything that I believe and everything that I do, insofar as it's consistent with what I believe, and of course it isn't, always, comes from that story of, of how I got where I am. And everybody has a different journey, everybody has a different story, but the only way for people to rationally communicate is to narrate where they are in terms of how they got there. And then two people in rational dialogue can look down the path together and say, well, here's, here's how it looks from where I'm standing. And somebody else can say, well, it doesn't look quite like that from where I'm standing. And maybe we can get, stand a little closer together to where our perspectives are a little closer. Maybe we can say, well, if you look at it like this, okay, maybe stand, stand up here and this light might make it. Now do you see it? Okay, now I can kind of see it a little better. That's the metaphor that I have for the life of inquiry is you're just, you're just two people trying to, like, get close enough to share enough of a perspective 
and try to help each other see how things look from your perspective. And if you end up adopting that perspective, then things will look that way to you too, and you'll adopt that outlook on the subject matter in the future. And so that contrasts nicely with a certain kind of uh, picture of, of rational life. Which brings me to the title. You know, I, I, I must have been in a little bit of a bad mood when I picked this title. Um, Ezra asked me for a topic and I said, I don't know, but it'll be, just use this title. It was, what is it, religion, irreligion, and stupidity? I, all, I, all I can think is I was having a bad day. Um... But it's easy to have bad days these days in our political and religious climate, in the, the climate of dialogue that we have. It's easy to have a bad day. It's easy because you run into stupidity all, all the time. Not least of which in the mirror sometimes for me. But let me tell you how I'm using the word stupidity in this context. It's a certain combination of ignorance and arrogance. It's, <clears throat> it's, and it's usually manifest in a sort of unjustified certainty or even smugness. And neither is sufficient on its own. So you can have innocent, humble ignorance. Ignorance in and of itself is not any kind of character flaw at all. The, the whole philosophical method is based on understanding your ignorance, grasping your ignorance. The, the, the quest for understanding is driven by your understanding of your ignorance. That's how you direct your inquiry towards your ignorance. So insofar as I want to have an organized, well-structured, critical life of inquiry, the first thing I need to identify as best I can are my ignorances. Ignorance by itself is not a character flaw in any way. It's not sufficient for being stupid. Neither is arrogance. There are arrogant people who are arrogant because they're very smart, because they're so intelligent, because they're so well educated. And this sort of prideful erudition is not to be equated with stupidity. Stupidity, as I'm using it here, is a combination of ignorance and arrogance. And it's an ignorant ignorance because people don't know what they don't know. There's a sort of educated or enlightened ignorance where philosophy starts. Aristotle said that all philosophy begins in wonder. Wonder emanates from lack of knowledge, lack of understanding. I wonder what, you don't say, I wonder whether, when you, if you know for sure, or if you fully understand, you never think, well, I wonder where. Wonder emanates from ignorance, finitude, lack of understanding. It's the beginning of philosophy. So stupidity, as I use it here, means a combination of ignorance and arrogance, the sort of ignorant ignorance that doesn't know what it doesn't know. Therefore, the opposite of stupidity involves two traits. One is being well-informed, reading from a variety of different backgrounds, being someone who doesn't just read one little thing, one blog post, one meme. I mean, that's how we argue on Facebook. We alternate posting memes. People aren't reading books. They're not reading stories. The articles they're posting are from Slate or Salon or HuffPost. Or, or whatever the Christian version of those are. And, and it's all ideology all the way down. And the, it's a war of ideologies back and forth. And the first casualty is the truth. Because nobody's trying to adopt the perspective of another. It's all negating the other person. It's like Monty Python's argument clinic. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. And then it ex escalates into name-calling. So the first trait of the opposite of stupidity is being well-informed, being a true seeker, reading, reading books that, that go against the view that you hold now, reading books 
from reading and seeking out the best sources of the opposition and reconstructing their arguments in the best, strongest ways possible. That's the beginning of non-stupidity. And there's a quote from Pascal that I want to read in this case that talks about the importance of reading about important things and the importance of inquiry. It's kind of a long quote, but I think this is really important because people are not seeking to understand the perspective of other people today. They're just wanting to, to espouse their position in the, in the snarkiest, wittiest, one-upmanshipest way they possibly can. So this is, this is Pascal. His subject is the immortality of the soul, but it stands in for any other important issue. The immortality of the soul is a matter which is of so great consequence to us and which touches us so profoundly that we must have lost all feeling to be indifferent as to knowing what it is. All our actions and thoughts must take such different courses according as there are or are not eternal joys to be hoped for, that it is impossible to take one step with sense and judgment unless we regulate our course by our view of this point which ought to be our ultimate end. So the idea there is, look, if, there's, if this whole story, this whole Christian story, this afterlife and all this stuff is true, then, it, then that should guide your life. And if it's false, then that should guide your life. If I became a very convinced atheist, I would absolutely oppose Christianity to the max. Because if it's true, I mean, if, if, if Christianity is false, then it's robbing lots of people of important earthly goods. In some cases, the only earthly goods those people will ever know. So... If, if I were an atheist, I would ab- it would be critically important to oppose Christianity and all forms of religion. He continues, Thus our first interest and our first duty is to enlighten ourselves on these subjects, whereon depends all our conduct. Therefore, among those who do not believe, I make a vast difference between those who strive with all their power to inform themselves and those who live without troubling or thinking about it. And then he comments on each kind of person. I can only have compassion for those who sincerely bewail their doubt, who regard it as the greatest of misfortunes, and who, sparing no effort to escape it, make of this inquiry their principal and most serious occupation. I think every day, not nonstop, but... It's like the dialogue in my head never stops. It never really stops. Maybe it pauses for a little while and I do other things, but it is the background of my entire mental life, thinking about the way that Christian beliefs fit with other beliefs, thinking about what the right way to think about certain issues are that are relevant to faith and immortality and it just, it never stops. You know, I don't, I'm not necessarily advocating a kind of unhealthy obsession, but the, it, I am asserting this, the inquiry should never stop. Be- because we can't be certain of anything, the most important things should always remain live questions, open things where we continue to, I mean, every year I read whatever the newest books are on arguments against the, exu- against the existence of God from evil or whatever. I'm keeping up to date on these things. And I think, that, I think that it only makes sense to do that and not to put those discussions to rest. Then he talks about the other kind. But as for those who pass their life without thinking of this ultimate end of life and who, for the sole reason that they do not find within themselves the lights which convince them of it, neglect to seek them elsewhere and to examine thoroughly whether this opinion is one of those which people received with credulous simplicity or one of those which, although obscure in themselves, have nevertheless a solid foundation, I look upon them in quite a different manner. So the big difference in my view, and I would affirm exactly this in the opposite direction, same for Christians, exactly the same. The difference in my mind isn't so much between those who believe and those who don't but those who are continuing to search and think and reflect and those who aren't. That's the biggest difference is 
the difference between the people who keep the dialogue going, continue to think about these things, have an active life of the mind, dialogue with people in goodwill, truly search for the truth on the one hand versus those who say, nah, I, I, I read a post about that. It's, it's, all, it's all junk. So first form of anti-stupidity is being well-informed. And that means not just reading your own people. The second is calm engagement and willingness to learn. Calm engagement and willingness to learn and to what's called conciliate. Because conciliation is more than just agreement and disagreement. Conciliation is growing uh, growing acceptance of the plausibility of somebody else's view. It's not like the only outcome of dialogue can be, well, you convinced me, I changed my mind. Another outcome of dialogue is, you know, I've never quite thought about it that way. That makes more sense than it ever has before. That's not as crazy as I thought it was. That, that sort of conciliation is an extremely important outcome of dialogue. And it, and it occurs along a spectrum. It's not binary. Belief is not just a switch that you flip on and flip off. Either you would believe it or you don't. Belief comes along a spectrum from near certainty, never full certainty in my view, to complete doubt. And every step in between. And as you investigate, as you gather evidence, as you reflect, it can go up and down. Just like in any uh, show any doctor or lawyer show where they're trying to diagnose a case or, or investigate a case, you get more information, the probability goes up, and then there's a counterexample or new information is discovered or a test, a, a test is given, and then your credence goes down. And so it's very sinusoidal. So be willing to enter into the other person's perspective and grasp the plausibility of what they're saying. Calm engagement and willingness to learn. Now, there are certain conver there are certain people on the scene who talk about these things that I think do not manifest these virtues very well. And I think one of them, I think one of them is very frequently Richard Dawkins. Um, Here's a statement by Richard Dawkins on what he calls his ultimate 747 gambit, which is basically the argument that there's almost certainly not a God because um, the God posited to explain the complexity of the world would have to be more complex, and so you would get nowhere in the explanation. So he says, the ultimate 747 gambit is a very serious argument against the existence of God and one to which I have yet to hear a theologian give a convincing answer despite numerous opportunities and invitations to do so. Dan Dennett rightly describes it. Now remember, he's talking about his own argument. He's quoting another person talking about his argument. Dan Dennett rightly describes it as an unrebuttable refutation as devastating today as it was when Philo used it to trounce clean thieves in Hume's dialogue two centuries earlier. That's not open-mindedness. That's not an attempt to understand the perspective of the other. His perspective is basically ab near absolute certainty that 200 years ago, this whole view is trounced and it's over. There's really no dialogue. And so, so he quotes Dennett there. And here's Dennett saying more about Dawkins' book. He says, if you encounter people who think it might still be intellectually respectable to believe in God in any literal sense, direct them to the God delusion where they will get their heads dismantled and reassembled with a different perspective. That is not the language of calm, sympathetic engagement and rational dialogue. That is the language of false certainty. And because of this, and because of the inability to back it up philosophically, Michael Ruse says, Michael Ruse is an atheist and uh, a very, he's a philosopher of science and 
and himself a very, very committed atheist. And he says, Dawkins would fail any introductory philosophy of religion course, and the God delusion made me ashamed to be an atheist. Now, Dawkins is a great writer and very intelligent and good at what he does. Now, having written a couple of articles on Dawkins' ultimate 747 gambit, I don't think that there's, there's much there. Certainly not something that is unrebuttable refutation that is devastating and trouncing. There's, you know, uh, if you, I'm happy, you know, I'm happy to send you the article that I wrote on it. I don't want to go into the details. But I tried to set aside the rhetoric and just read it carefully for what it is and just give it a, a, a calm, rational answer from the standpoint of the philosophy of science. But why is Dawkins' rhetoric so satisfying for so many people? Why is Dawkins' rhetoric so satisfying for so many people? I think it's easy to explain why. Because the rhetoric on the other side of the aisle from very vocal major segments of Christianity have set the tone in exactly that sense. That they have preached Christianity from a false certainty in the same sort of stupid in my sense way, one that is based on ignorance one that is based on lack of knowledge of science, one that is based on lack of knowledge of philosophy, and one that presents Christianity in a smug way that does not in any way express openness to this perspective of other people. So it's no big surprise when somebody comes along and says, well, to hell with you. That makes people want to stand up and cheer when they have been subject to that same sort of attitude on the other side. If you've been raised in a closed-minded or small-minded or oppressive religious environment, then when a guy like Richard Dawkins comes along and is a great writer, you are going to stand up and cheer. And I can certainly say that if I thought Christianity was what Richard Dawkins thinks it is, I would be right there beside him. I would be right there beside him because I feel just as strongly against the thing that he's actually arguing against, I think, as he does. But I just think there are better defenders of atheism. I think there are much better defenders of atheism with much better arguments. I think Eric Wielenberg gives better arguments. There's a classic book by J.L. Mackey, The Miracle of Theism, that gives better arguments. John Schellenberg gives better arguments. Michael Tooley gives better arguments. There are sophisticated, thoughtful, virtuous atheists. And any Christian who thinks that they can dismiss somebody just because they've read a blog post or have a bunch of Bible verses memorized is stupid. And so I, I've just got a plea to not be stupid. And from, as, from what I can tell, at least within the American milieu, from within the history that's relevant to the, Christian to, the, to the American situation at present, the stupidity started with the Christians. And that any stupidity that is coming back on the other side, not any but most and much, is a reaction to something that was coming at them. And so I want to issue a plea to Christians to not be stupid. Educate yourself with the arguments on the other side and not just the straw man arguments. Educate yourself with the best arguments against Christianity. Educate yourself with the best arguments for atheism. Educate yourself with the strongest versions of the problem of evil. And then think about those things deeply and learn from them. Don't just 
preach. Don't just argue. Don't just seek to win a battle. Seek to understand. Be improved as a human being by your reflections upon the features of the world that don't seem to fit in very well with your faith. Whatever I have of value in my faith came as the result of struggling with stuff that went against it, whether in my own life and activity or in what I believed. The struggle is what has given me whatever goodness I have in my faith, whether mentally or in my life. And the incompleteness and imperfection of my mental life and my actions is the best tutor that I have. And so when I think about some of the stupid debates that I see on the internet, between Christians and non-Christians, between the religious in general and the irreligious in general, the common denominator between stupid religious dialogue seems to be a certain sort of shared picture of Christianity as very narrow and limited and static. And that's not the Christianity that I know. That's not the Christianity that I try to hang on to. The Christianity that I try to hang on to is imperfect, growing, still clay on the wheel. I'm still working out what I believe. I'm still working out how I ought to behave, how I ought to act, what my life ought to look like. And the more I'm confronted with my limitations and my imperfections and, and my ignorances, the more liberated I feel from the false certainties that isolate me from the rancor and extremism that I see in internet dialogue on religion. That's where I'm coming from. That's what I'm seeking to cultivate. That's what I'm pouring myself into in my academic and non-academic life. And I've got nothing to offer anyone but a narration of my own struggles from within the context of my own story. In my introductory remarks, I mentioned the, the events of 9-11, the horrors that occurred in that, the religious inspiration of it on both, both the act itself and honestly, I think the religious inspiration of the creating of conditions that made the act itself make sense to the people who did it. I don't think that's independent of certain sort of religious perspectives. But the, the horrors that occurred on that day, both in the planning and execution, the laying of the groundwork, and the things that happened, the images, if, I don't, some of you are barely old enough to remember it, but horrible, horrible horrible images, things that I'm currently not willing to describe because my young children are here. I don't even want to describe for them the things that we saw happen live on television, the choices that people made as they were on windowsills at that time. If you are a Christian or any kind of religious believer and that does not make you deeply uncomfortable, then you're not paying attention. If you are a Christian who thinks that atheists are mean or dumb or ignorant or evil, then you need to get out more. 
there are, probably the majority of my friends are not Christians. They, I've got atheist friends that aren't just friends. They're people that I care about deeply, good, smart, intelligent, wonderful, virtuous people that I care deeply about whose perspective on the world does not include God. If you are in an isolated enough environment that you don't interact with people like that, get out more. Be engaged, but be engaged non-stupidly. Don't preach it, people. Try to understand that perspective. It's not hard for me to understand that perspective because I used to have it. And when I see what I see when I review the footage of 9-11, it's easy for me to adopt the perspective or to see the plausibility of the perspective of someone whose worldview does not include God. And so, I re even though those things don't make me not believe in God, they make the manner in which I believe in God very different than they otherwise would be. They affect what I believe about the nature of God. They affect what I believe about what I ought to do to right wrongs in the world, the, the structural wrongs that make those acts seem right to people. So please, if you are a Christian or other religious believer, don't be stupid. Be engaged educate yourself, engage in humble dialogue, try to adopt other people's perspectives, try to see the plausibility in what they're saying. I love people first. Ideas come second. If you are not loving the person that you are in dialogue with, you're screwed up. People come before arguments. People come before positions. Before there was any religion, the narrative of creation in the Bible says that God created humans and that they were good. If your fundamental starting point in dialogue with other people isn't their fundamental underlying goodness, regardless of what they believe, then you're missing the point. Start with the person and engage in a common quest to have a broadened understanding from which we can try to build a coherent picture of the world that makes sense both of the profound evils of life and the profound goods of life. Because that's ultimately, I think, as a philosopher, what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to find one perspective that explains both the amazing stuff of life, and the horrible stuff of life. And the reason why I continue to believe in God is just this simple. I find it easier to fit both those things into, I find it easier to fit the evil into the God picture than I do the good into the not God picture. That's what it comes, that's what it boils down to for me. But that's the goal, to, in, to, to try to fit all the things that I believe about the world and know about the world into one picture and, and to share that, to share that journey with as many other people as I possibly can. And so I invite you into that journey and into that dialogue. So that's where I want to end it, just about a, one hour. Over here for the live questions on the microphone. We have questions being submitted online right now. And I'm getting ones texted to me from people who are watching the stream on mic. <laughs> so we'll go from Dr. Doherty's phone, <laughs> the laptop, and the microphone. What's your first question the there? Fir the first question is, um, don't be stupid is good advice, but harder to follow. How do you get that done? Um, how do you be not stupid? This is a really good question. I, I'm still trying to figure that out myself. Um, but insofar as I'm using the word stupid to convey 
two principal traits, um, ignorant ignorance and um, arrogance, uh, the first thing to do, I think, is to seek out someone of the opposite perspective who shows signs of being uh, an intelligent, well-read, and sympathetic interlocutor, and just asking them, say, hey, what do you think is the strongest argument for your position? Um, I also tend to ask people who disagree with me, what do you think is the strongest argument from my perspective? Um, so I think the first thing to do to try to be not stupid is to, uh, is to just seek the advice of other people from the perspectives you're uh, not convinced of and ask them. Say, well, what do you think I should read? But you also have to be on the lookout for people who are themselves well-read and people who aren't the bombastic kind, right? But the people who seem like genuinely curious um, people who are on a journey to understand the truth, not people who just want to win an argument. So that's, that's the, I think that's the first step. Just, and again, notice, for me, always social. Find people to talk with who are intelligent, well-read, sympathetic. Hi, Trent. All right, so how can I not be stupid and still win Facebook debates? No, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> that's not my question. Um, so you mentioned, actually, when you went to seminary that uh, there was a big divide between the pastors and the theologians, mm -hmm. uh, where the thinkers were trying to figure it out on the other side, where the doers were trying to mm -hmm. you know, love people. The classic dichotomy between the active and contemplative life. Yes, there you go. Um, so how do we as thinkers, uh, analyzing the stupidity of the church, uh, go back to the church and mm -hmm. convince them not to be stupid? Now, I know that's a big question, but have you learned anything in your experience, seen anything, done anything that you've found particularly effective with that? Well, I think that's a good question. And I, I, I love questions that are practically oriented because I don't want my stuff to just be, you know, sound bites or whatever. I, I, I'm, I'm an empiricist at heart. I want to see differences in the world. I want to observe differences in the world. I want to know what's working and what's not. I'm just, my, this, my, my wife can tell you I am obsessed with verification. I just want to know what works. Same way in politics. I have no politics. I'm an anarchist. I don't vote. I don't have positions on like, oh, taxes are bad. No, taxes are good. Like, let's see what works. I'm very much a pragmatist about that sort of thing. So I appreciate the, the practical orientation of your question. Um, it's going to differ by vocation. I'm a teacher. And so what I do is I preach this message in my classes and try to teach them methods of inquiry equip them with the skills of inquiry, like formal logic. I introduce them to a wide variety of high-quality uh, written work on both sides of the subject. So for me, as an educator, it involves trying to inculcate skills and knowledge in the context in which I can provide them. I think if I were, say, a lawyer or something, I would maybe have a reading group or something, or I would just invite Whoever might, I mean, basically it comes into who are your interlocutors? Invite them into that dialogue. And any influence you have over people from within your perspective, just encourage them to adopt this mode of being. There's no like big overarching magic bullet. It just takes each person within each community exerting whatever influence they happen to have in encouraging people towards these virtues and inviting people into the dialogue. It's no harder or easier than that. It's just going to vary by individual context. Trent, thanks for your talk. And, uh, I didn't I know you were going to be here. Yeah, surprise. Uh, came down. Um, and I think it's important. I have two quick questions. My first one I know you're sort of interested in, which is, what role does faith have in this discussion? Mm -hmm. um, you, men you mentioned the importance of uh, not having false certainty. Mm -hmm. And I think Christianity often puts faith in opposition to that. Mm -hmm. and so I'm wondering if you could talk about that. And then okay. the second one is, um, what would you say to people like myself who maybe feel like we can't comprehend a lot of the more technical philosophical arguments on both sides of the debate? Mm -hmm. 
um, but who are still seeking mm -hmm. and maybe can't really come to the greatest understanding possible? Mm -hmm. Those are both really good questions. Um, I'll answer the second one first because I remember it. <laughs> um, look, there's all of us, there's always something over our heads, right? No matter how high you go. And you think, well, maybe it tops out with the smartest person there is. Well, it doesn't because people are smart in different things, yeah. right? And so the person who's smartest in one thing isn't the smartest in another. So there's nobody who's like smartest in all the relevant things. So every person, no matter how high the level of scholarship or, inte or intellect, is depending on other people. Academia is social. Understanding is social. Knowledge is social. It's done in community, and that's important. We are all dependent, rational animals, to use Alistair McIntyre's phrase. Um, so if you find yourself in a position to where, suppose you're evaluating the modal ontological argument, and you think, I just don't understand this. Um, there's two things you can do. Focus on what you do understand and let that be your biggest guide. One of the things I tell my philosophy students right up front, both graduate and undergraduate, is don't let what you don't know undermine what you do know. There's always more to learn. There's always another paradox out there. Don't let what you don't know undermine what you do know. There, work with what is most obvious to you, what is closest to you, what you have the best grasp on. And so for me, that's like the universe is basically there, it's like a spilled glass of water. It's either on purpose or on accident. So I need to work out what are the features of things that happen on purpose, what are the features of things that happen on accident, which does it more seem like to me, and honestly, I don't think the rational reconstruction of the arguments are the, should be your biggest guide there. I honestly think, in a certain sense, your most natural evocative response to the world should be your best guide. Hume thought this. Hume thought this. In the dialogues concerning natural religion, Hume, Philo doesn't speak just, he's not Hume's only voice, and the deconstructing of some of those arguments People miss the fact that he also says the most natural response to the world is, it's like, there's something here. There's something behind this. The details, I don't know. Don't ask me about the details. But the world doesn't seem just like a pure accidental mechanism. So I think in, in one respect, people should just go back to first base, go back to their fundamental intuitions about the things that are cl closest to them, their, what they think about human beings, the value and worth of human beings, the value and worth of the natural world, what they perceive when they look inside what they take themselves to be, if they take themselves to be a free, moral, rational agent versus a mechanism. Those are, to me, those are the fundamentals. What was the first one again? The first one was about uh, faith and... Role of faith, right. So second question, part B, is the, the external... Make a judgment about who you think are the best guides, right? Who seems to be the best guide? I'm a maniac about nutrition and fitness. And I've been in the fitness and nutrition world for long enough to see a lot of trends come and go. <laughs> the experts have contradicted themselves like 10 times in my lifetime, right? Like eggs are bad, eggs are good, eggs are bad, eggs are good, but it's good, but it's bad. You know, uh, carbo load, carbs will kill you, you know. Um, I'm reading a book right now called The Big Fat Secret about accessing, you know, good, the good fats, the fatty acids. Man, it's complicated. So you got to find out who are, who appear to be my most reliable guides. The people who have the broadest knowledge of the broadest subjects, who have spent the most time studying those things, and who seem to have the most open-minded character. If I want to understand anything in the world that's above my head, that's what I do. I rely on others. But it's not like I just have to accept as the experts who the proclaimed experts are in the newspapers. I can form an informed opinion about who the experts are by thinking about who's got the broadest knowledge of the greatest number of issues, who's thought about it the most, and who seems most in tune with tr the real search for truth. And, you know, in my lifetime, the person who exemplifies that more than anyone else is Richard Swinburne, yeah. who's become a close friend of mine. The guy has read everything. He thinks about it all the time, and he's like, 
if he thinks he's wrong, he'll correct himself, he'll update, he'll expand his views, modify his views. He's willing to go against the current conventional wisdom. So there's a guy where I'm like, this guy's an incredible guide from, from the criteria that I set out. Another is my colleague here at Baylor, Alex Pruce. The guy's the smartest <laughs> human person I've ever met in my life. And that includes going to, you know, at this point, who knows, a dozen conferences at Oxford and around the world. He's the smartest human person I've ever met. He's also tied, and he's in a many way tied for gentlest human I've ever met, kindest human I've ever met, and one who is so dedicated to the truth above ideology and all else that basically he's the best guide that I've ever met. So you, so you have these criteria, you see who meets those criteria, you take a consensus view among those people, that's, that's how I think you treat ex expert testing. Now, the faith thing is big because there's this notion of faith that's like Mark Twain said, I think, like, believe in what you know ain't so. Right. <laughs> or believe in, you know, believe in against the evidence or believe in without evidence. I, that, I think that's terrible. I think faith is terrible. If by faith you mean that sort of, you know, believing against the evidence or believing without evidence, I don't think you should ever believe anything without adequate evidence. But I think that any account of scientific confirmation demands a fairly broad notion of evidence um, that particularly involves numerous theoretical virtues coming together in a single story. And so I think that ultimately the concept of faith that I think is the one that's in the Christian tradition has nothing to do with being stupid and believing without evidence, what it has to do is, it, it has to do with your commitment to living that out. Your commitment to living that out. It's not like faith makes up for evidence because you're now more sure than you should be. It's that, okay, even given my doubts, I am going to be faithful. So when I hear faith, I think that almost all faith discourse should be replaced with faithfulness discourse. Because I think that's what at least the Christian Bible talks about is just because you have doubts, you don't bail. You know, you're my friend. If I have doubts about you, I'm not just going to jump ship immediately. I'm not just going to bail. I'm going to be there for you. I'm going to walk by your side. And there may come a point, right, when I'm like, dude, you have crossed the line. That is it. But it's not going to be like every little doubt I have is going to keep me from being your friend and being in your life. I want to be faithful to you. I want to be a faithful friend. And Christians are called to faithfulness in the sense that even amidst their doubt and uncertainties, they try to do the right thing and try to follow that path. Thanks. Question submitted online. Uh, question from my daughter, Emerson Ailey. <laughs> Whose who birthday it is today? No, who asked, have you sang happy birthday to Simeon, who is here <laughs> oh, tonight in the right crowd? There. Simeon, would you stand up, please? Simeon turned 12 today. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Simeon. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. You could, you could tell there was a preponderance of male voices in the room. There was. There's we a, apologize a, for yes. that as a gender. Yes. Question submitted from Ben. Suppose you are philosophically informed and you're talking with someone who is not. But suppose also this person thinks they are very well informed. Consider a, new, a militant new atheist or some fundamentalist Christian. How should we go about humbly informing this person that they are, to use your word, stupid? <laughs> how, do you t how do you tell people they're stupid? Uh, when they think they are not. Quickly and run. Um, 
you know, there's the old saying, you can't fix stupid. Well, you can't fix everybody. Sometimes the answer is say, nice talking to you. I hope things work out and uh, I wish you the best. And that's it. I think sometimes Christians think like it's their job to fix everybody in the world or that everybody in the world is somehow, like, like nobody's ever at a juncture where what they need is not better answers. They just need to be in a different place in life. And when the, as the saying goes, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. There were times in my life when I was not educable, when I was not docile in the literal sense of the word, teachable. I needed more life experience. I needed to be broken and humbled. I still need that badly. Um, so I think some, so, so the first thing I want to do is just disavow the idea that we always need to answer people or, or that every conversation has to be engaged in or continued. Now, Amen, brother. Amen, brother. Jacob, can you uh, say hi to him? <laughs> that was awesome. That is the first time. This is not the first time that in a talk I've done, there's been an interlude of happy birthday, but it is absolutely the first time somebody has literally blown a horn. An interlude of repent. Yes. Yeah. That's not, that's that, not normal. Buy that man a drink. No, don't. No, don't. No, don't. The bartender's like, no, do not do that thing. Let him drink it out there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Some water. So now, if it was somebody, for example, that, that I was in an ongoing relationship with, like somebody that I was friends with or that I knew at work or somebody that I really did need to provide some sort of answer for, um, I, this is what I do. I say, here's a book that I think is a really good book on defending the faith. And I'm happy to read through it with you and discuss it chapter by chapter. And I pick a book like Richard Swinburne's The Existence of God. And I say, tell me when you've read chapter one really thoroughly. We'll get together at a coffee shop or wherever. And we'll just go through this chapter. Then the ball's in their court. They can either engage that text and you or not. And if they are just banging their head against the wall, then... You just do the best you can and, say, and try to isolate the most fundamental points. And, you know, there's no algorithm. But that's what I do. I pick a book and say, I'll read this book with you um, one chapter at a time. Sure. Yeah. Um, hi. I really enjoyed your talk. I, I'm, also, I'm also a new faculty at Baylor. Oh. So. Cheers. Yeah, cheers. What department? So, uh, mathematics. Yes. So during or faculty orientation, I got to thinking about this concept of commitment, I, you know, especially in the context of faith. I, I've had a very different story from, from you. I, I guess one could say I grew up Christian, and I've always been Christian. But nevertheless, I think you, know, you and I share this uh, temperament, which is to always think, mm -hmm. to always have this dialogue going on inside and, and thinking, you know, basically questioning everything that you believe all the time. But, you know, how do you reconcile that with things, w w with basic commitments in life? You know, like, for example, uh, at Baylor, uh, as faculty, we're asked to sign a faith statement, essentially, and, and say well, that, that we believe. Kind of. Uh, kind of, yeah, okay, so I'm not naive. But, um, you know, does that... It, you could ask this about so many walks of life, right? I told my wife uh, on my wedding day that I would love her for my entire life. Do I actually know that? I mean, <laughs> you know, do, do you ever really know anything? But, but nevertheless, uh, Christianity, the, the tradition really has a very strong uh, call to commitment. Yeah, sure. You know, you, you read the letter to the Hebrews and it says, don't fall away. If you fall away, I mean, that's it. You're toast, right? On some views, yeah. And, 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 and so, you, I mean, at so least you could see. say there's some strong language. Yeah. So, so I was just wondering, like, 
you know, how do you kind of think about this relationship between this quest for ultimate, and, and you describe it as commitment, right? Commitment to truth above all else. That's right. With your other commitments, right? And, and yep. we all have them. So, th so the fundamental question, as I understand it, is how do I um, fit together this idea of commitment to truth above everything else and, and questioning the foundations of all that I believe on the one hand, and on the other hand, the commitment one makes as a Christian, which he rightly compared to the commitment one makes when one gets married. And let me just get this out of the way right now. Here's one way. The commitments aren't absolute. If I discovered, if they, if they authentically confirmed the bones of Jesus in a grave in Palestine, I would chuck Christianity instantly. I'm not committed to Christianity over and above the truth. So that if the balance of evidence weighed heavily against Christianity, that'd be it. That'd be it. So the commitment is not absolute. What the commitment does is it keeps a constant in your activity when doubt is sinusoidal. So my first college teaching job was teaching stats, st teaching stats in an econ department. And I talked about the importance of stats in econ by connecting it to the expected utility formula, um, a weighted average of the utility of the outcome or the probability of that outcome given the action. And so, look, there are, there are great goods that are so great that, it, that the, your, the wisdom of following those paths outstrips any doubts you're likely to have. This is like Pascal's wager. So if you really believe that the Christian package, say, is of infinite value, then you'll walk that path, or even arbitrarily large finite value. We don't have to get all Cantorian. We can do that later, since you're a math guy. Um, rather, say, look, this is my best bet. And I will walk this path in hope that it turns out well, and, and, and the probabilities can, can crest or fall almost anywhere as long as the outcome you think is one that is the most worthy outcome there is. And so you mentioned marriage, and th that is a commitment. Let's face it, that's also not absolute. It's nearly absolute in my personal view, but it's not absolute. Now, I've, as of Last month, I've been married 23 years, and <laughs> yeah. clap for her. <laughs> she, uh, she needs the applause, um, and your donations and sympathy. And somebody, buy that woman a drink. Um, now, to be married for 23 years meant maintaining my commitment at a, at a constant when my feelings and beliefs, and lots of things were very sinusoidal. So that's where I think the idea of commitment fits in with the, the stuff that changes and the inquiry and the shifting evidence is it has to do with how good the outcome is, a sufficiently valuable outcome. It's still prudent to pursue even in the midst of great doubt, and uncertainty. And as you know, that can be given mathematical precision in the expected utility formula. But that's the basic idea, is the goodness of the goal is really what's doing the work there in the, in the consistency. It's a value thing. The cognitive part, frankly, is second. Question submitted online by Gordon. You say it's the Christian who basically created the Richard Dawkins effect. Are there churches and Christians out there that are getting it right when it comes to dialogue and putting people first? Yeah, okay. I know there are because I meet such people on a fairly regular basis. I have many wonderful colleagues who are my counterparts in other universities who share the same basic perspective, who are way beyond where I am in their ability to 
actually live out Christian virtue um, and who are smarter than I am and who share my obsession with thinking through these things. People like Josh Rasmussen, for example, Aaron Cobb. I mean, I'm not going to name names, so I'll leave somebody out. But there are lots of people. Now, I don't know where those guys go to church. And as a Catholic, like, you don't really focus on individual churches the same way you do as a Protestant. As a Protestant, the individual church you go to, like, really matters. As a Roman Catholic, it's like, it doesn't matter. What matters is that Jesus is there. And, like, I'll go to, there's lots of different parishes that I'll go to in town. I try to have a main parish we go to. But we'll go to different parishes because it's the same Jesus. And there's not, my identity is tied to something sort of global and not something so local. But, you know, I've seen ministries, like occasionally I'll see a a YouTube video, like there's this church on the move that creates some pretty nice content on YouTube. And I will certainly meet lots of other Christians. So whether there's like an entire church doing this, I don't know, probably some, but I don't think you can expect like an entire church to live out any single virtue uniformly. It's, 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 we're all on our own individual journey and there are collections of people that are on this path and there are lots of them, but they go to lots of different churches. So the question is, probably yes. I mean, the answer to the question, the direct answer to the question is, probably yes. I don't know what they are because I don't think that way. But my evidence that there are consists, or um, my evidence that if there aren't, there's a sort of church among the churches that consists in all of these people that I know exist from my years in the field. And and they're the sort of church within the church of people who are trying to uh, live out the non-stupid Christian faith that I'm inviting people into. All right. Hey, Trent. I mean, remember earlier on when we talked, we mentioned a little bit of orthodoxy, mm-hmm. and you mentioned that you were once close to converting to orthodoxy. So let me mention a figure who's a very high influence in orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism, namely St. John Chrysostom. You know, when we see Chrysostom, he's going to be thinking with what one North American philosopher of religion is called the warfare worldview, talking of Christianity with like this warfare language that he's been entrusted with holy weapons that empower him to battle demons. And when we know when we trace this back to the quote-unquote historic or Jesus, you see this element of spiritual warfare. It's a very high importance in his worldview that we as the uh, general sainthood, we're not just like in a peacetime universe, but in a universe that is caught in the midst of the spiritual war against the powers of Hades. And our king is this risen, you know, Christus Victor, Christ the victor over all powers of hell. And, you know, I agree with you that, you know, there is like this sacred value to all human beings who we have an ethical obligation before God Almighty to respect. But, you know, we also have like this rescue um, or like liberational aspect to our sainthood where we are also, you know, battling the demons that are oppressing those people. What's so your, I'm curious what's your question? as to how you as, a, as you as a Catholic philosopher kind of reconcile this commitment to spiritual warfare with your epistemological and metaphysical okay. commitments. Yeah, I think I get that. So okay. as I understand the basic question, it's, it's kind of like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of cast it in a, in a, in a sort of a humorous way. It's like, Doherty, uh, you're being quite conciliatory here. What about all this talk about spiritual warfare? And isn't there something about, like, not just dialogue, but aren't we supposed to, quote, save people? And say, so, okay, so there the answer is, yeah. Um, But the person we're most called to save is ourselves. And the great, and the first and primary form of spiritual warfare is against our own selfishness, our own self-centeredness, our own pride, um, our own shortcomings, um, our own inhumanities. Um, and so, so just like in Islam, the principal meaning of jihad is the spiritual warfare to become a true Muslim, to be someone who is truly submissive to God's will. That's the essence of Islam, is to be submissive to God's will. And the primary jihad is over self-will. This is also the fundamental spiritual warfare of Buddhism, to overcome self-will, and it's the principal spiritual warfare of Christianity to overcome self-will. Um, now, insofar as there's a secondary battle that involves other people, 
I like the old phrase, it's one beggar leading another beggar where to find bread. Um, it's that the church isn't a temple for saints so much as a hospital for sinners. And when, when Christians reach out to other people thinking um, that their life would be better if they were Christians, it's because in part they're trying to get that person to see themselves as good in a very special way, made in the image of God. So, so yeah, and, and a lot of times people who don't see themselves as made in the image of God, who don't understand how valuable, how infinitely valuable they are, um, that's a sort of spiritual disease. And, and the medicine, part of the medicine for that is providing them with a context within which to see their infinite value. And so I think that's the first and foremost form of, of, of spiritual warfare when it comes to extrinsic, you know, trying to quote unquote help or save other, other people. But dealing with my own problems is my first and foremost spiritual warfare. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, in Dallas and Fort Worth, it's Hang very... on, hang on. This is my mom. What? Is that why she's wearing those sunglasses to try to fool you? No, I know who she is. She's like, maybe he won't recognize me. Yeah. No, and I is this a this fake is, beard? Is I, he trying I, to... No, this I is, have, this, I yeah. have a, a visual problem and the lights mess with yeah. me. Okay. Uh, in Dallas and Fort Worth, it's very common for there to be an atheist and a Christian debating. That doesn't happen in Waco, ever. Why not? Well, uh, I think I actually have an answer to this, or at least a partial answer. I, can, I, can par I know that I can partly explain this because I'm partly responsible for it. Um, and the reason is this. Um, I think the debate paradigm is limited. I think it's too oppositional and too confrontational and too competitive. And it should not be either the primary and certainly not the only method of engagement between Christians and non-Christians or people of different uh, perspectives. Um, you know, I've done debates in the past. I'm perfectly comfortable with it. Frankly, I'm too comfortable with it. You know why I won't debate people who disagree with me? Because it makes me a worse person. Because it, it, it feeds into my... It feeds into my vices. And typically when I debate somebody, I degrade myself and become a worse person. And I'm a, and I'm a, bad, a bad Christian when I do that. People, people can do whatever they want. But I am, what I promote is a different model of engagement. So on, my, uh, on the AV section, on the AV section of my website, there are multiple interviews. Uh, there's an, there's a, what I do is I interview people. There's, so there's an interview with atheist Eric Wielenberg where we are sitting side by side at a table. We're not opposed to one another. We are side by side at a table and I am asking him his perspective and questioning that. And he is asking me my perspective and questioning that. I find that in this age of rancor and anger, and ideology and confrontation, in that particular context, I find that a discussion, a side-by-side -side discussion, especially between two people who know each other, because Eric's a friend of mine, um, is more fruitful than the debate format, and that we've got a million debates on YouTube. No end of debates, but very few um, pointed, but sympathetic dialogues. It's almost, I mean, it's just almost unheard of. And so I'm just trying to round out the picture with a, 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 a different way of doing it. So, I mean, there are audio ones too, but there's tons of, or you can, I mean, I listen to YouTube way more than I watch it. My number one use of YouTube is to, is to listen uh, to, to stuff in the background. The, in fact, sometimes there's nothing but audio. So like the Bertrand Russell debate with Father Copleston, I don't think there is any video for that. I think it's just audio. 
Hey. hey. Um, two questions. Um, if if it's uh, stupidity is arrogance and ignorance combined, and there's nothing wrong with being ignorant, right? We all are. It seemed like the answer on how we keep from being stupid had a lot to do with being well read and dialogue with other people. It seems like the easiest thing would be just to not be arrogant, and then you're yeah. Then you're at worst you're just ignorant, which is yeah forgivable. Well, certainly I <clears throat> certainly I think the character side of it is the the more poignant aspect. Um, but I did distinguish between um, ignorant ignorance and innocent ignorance. And I think that, um, yeah. uh, so, so certainly I think the biggest battle is the moral one and, and trying to cultivate a personal habit of honestly caring about what other people think and cultivate a love of the truth above everything else. And, um, but I also think that one can go about this Socratic project of thinking about, okay, what are the main issues here? What do I, what do I know about the main issues? And how do I evaluate um, where my gaps are? And, and a lot of times that's going to involve, because again, I said this is all social, it's going to involve consulting other people, it's going to involve forming opinions about who's more informed than I am on the key issues, seeking their advice. Um, so to me, it always comes back to kind of a community project. So I'm really knowledgeable about certain things and less knowledgeable about other things. Um, and so I'm just going to try to rely upon everybody in my community and, of course, the Internet somewhat to piece together the best picture that I can. Um, so, so uh, and again, asking people of the opposite perspectives, like asking somebody who holds the atheist perspective, what do you think is the best defense of atheism? Asking somebody who's a Christian, what do you think is the best defense of Christianity? And then at least you're, you're not just sort of making assumptions about it. So, I mean, it's hard, but I do think that ignorant ignorance can be, is a really important kind of ignorance to, to overcome, at least become educated, at least, at least seek to have an educated ignorance. Yeah, I guess the ignorant ignorance, not knowing what you don't know, still seems unrelated to being well-read and well-versed in the issues. It can. I mean, it's Knowing not, what you don't know yeah. seems like a kind of existential, personal... It's got an existential, personal dimension. But I do think, and I don't think that any amount of reading guarantees that you'll have an educated ignorance. But I do think it provides resources for uncovering your ignorance because at least I know me personally, when I go to read a book about something that I take myself to be under-informed on, I'm like, oh, I never even thought about that. So at least if you're trying, the broad background of reading is going to provide you opportunities to realize there are things you hadn't thought about. Um, but all it can ever do, I think you're right, is be a mirror, and you've got to be truly looking for your gaps to see them. But, but, it, but you know, so just imagine two people. They both know they've got gaps, um, and neither one of them know where they are, and one is reading like crazy, and the other doesn't have access to any information. This guy's got some kind of advantage because he's got other people to point out to him. It's like, oh, no, no, no. Like, so people talk about the Crusades or whatever, the Spanish Inquisition, and then, you know, that's something I've read a couple of books about. So I'll say... Actually, you know, there just actually weren't that many people killed in the Spanish Inquisition. Um, that's something that I discovered myself in a book. And so that's just a case where I wouldn't have, I didn't know that I had that picture wrong. I didn't know that I had the numerical facts wrong. I discovered that by engaging an informed source on the subject. So my thesis at bottom is only that it provides the right kind of, it provides a person with the right attitude an additional advantage and tool. At the bottom, that's all I'm saying. I'm not okay. saying it's a fix-all. I'm not saying it he fixes everything or that it automatically heals bad character. I'm just saying that given an attempt to uncover one's ignorances, um, a lot of reading and discussion is a, is a help and a tool. Okay. Well, that, lead, all, that leads into my second question, which is, as an, as an anarchist myself, Could you and Chris? even... Um, Guys like Ivan Illick and oh. Elul commenting on our addiction and dependence on author outside authority and experts. There's a lot of discussion today about well-read and the experts mm -hmm. and the pros in the field 
and we don't really even live in the world we think we live in. Somebody else actually knows how the world is, and yeah. we're just all stumbling through it. There's got to, that's not most people. There's got to be a non-academic, non-scholarly model for this inquiry that is rooted much more in regular people's daily lives, in my opinion. Yeah. And I, would, I, I just feel like well-read, well-read, whether it's finding people you trust, whether it's how we do the inquiry, it's how we engage with people who disagree with mm -hmm. us, being well-read, and of course, even Ezra's mom was talking to me outside about seven, eight, ten syllable words and not understanding what people are even yeah. talking about, if that's sure. not your field, there's got to be another way yeah. that well, excludes that. Well, that's why, I, that's why I said to whoever asked that question that you, it ultimately goes back to common sense and the things that you have the best grasp on. The thing that I have the best grasp on of anything is what it's like to be a rational moral agent. Like, the thing that I don't need any outside information for is to know what it's like to be a rational, moral, reflective agent. And by moral, I just mean rational? an agent that makes... A ra all I mean by rational is a, a, a being that engages in critical reflection and wonders and thinks and considers pros and cons. And all I mean by moral is considers moral questions, thinks what should I do. I don't mean moral as in good moral. I just mean, as a, to me, a rash, all I mean by rational moral agent is a person with a reflective life that doesn't just have beliefs and desires, but has beliefs about their beliefs and desires about their desires and desires about their beliefs and beliefs about their desires. Somebody who's engaged in the reflective life and who perceives themselves to be an agent in the world making a difference with other people and other physical objects. The thing that I most fundamentally know more than anything else is what it's like to be a reflective person, a person with consciousness. Now, I think from that fundamental datum alone, you can go a long ways. So I'm all about the phenomenological method that says, start with what you know best, which is yourself and selfhood and personhood and work out from there. That's my uh, settled opinion methodologically about how to deal with the dilemma that you accurately raise. Cool. Thank you. Question submitted online from Kevin. What was the logically or theologically compelling reason to commit to the Roman Catholic Church? Well, I don't like to get into specific doctrinal stuff in um, forums that are interdenominational. Uh, I'm a true ecumenist. Um, I, I'm not here as defender of the Catholic faith. I'm not here as a defender of the Christian faith. I'm here as a defender of the calm, reflective search for truth. That's what I'm fun. I'm not here to defend Christianity. I'm here to defend rational dialogue. That's my thesis statement is, or my, 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 uh, my impetus is, don't be stupid, be more thoughtful. Um, but I can just say quickly the things that brought me into the Catholic Church were both rational and sort of mystical, for lack of a better word. My experience in the liturgy combined with becoming convinced about certain historical theses like the real presence of the Eucharist and apostolic succession. So I became convinced of some historical theses and I had certain experiences in liturgy. Two of those things conspired against me to make me Catholic. But the fundamental beliefs about the nature of the gospel that I have today are the same as they were when I was a semi-charismatic Nazarene. Thanks again for your talk. Um, I am wondering about, you said you're a defender of this reflective, non-stupid way of interacting with faith and with people of opposing beliefs. Which doesn't prevent me from being stupid. Absolutely. I haven't said that <laughs> explicitly yet, yeah. but sometimes I'm stupid, or more accurately, sometimes I'm not stupid. But at least I want to be not stupid. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering about people who don't quite interact with the world in this reflective way, who don't read books about ideas or maybe don't read books at all. Mm -hmm. Are those, I mean, clearly there's a good in loving and pursuing truth. Are those people that we should encourage to try to pursue truth in this way, or is or should we just be happy for the people who aren't stupid because they're not arrogant about their ignorance, but content with what they have and the faith they have? A, How I should we interact a, with them? Yeah, I think it's a spectrum. I think, I think everybody's called to grow in their reflectiveness on their faith. 
And so if you see somebody with a sort of simple faith, I mean, you don't necessarily want to go like cause them all these problems. But as a professor at a university where most students are Christian, yeah, I challenge their faith in class. I try to make them more reflective. I try to make them less complacent. So some people don't like that. Some people get mad about that. Some parents get mad about that. But the fact of the matter is, if you're going to live in the modern world, you've, the world is hostile to this point of view, and there is a virtue, an intrinsic virtue, in being intellectually courageous and open-minded. And so I problematize young people's Christian faith for the religiously, in a certain way, religiously neutral goal of promoting rational dialogue and investigation. I, I absolutely do that. So I guess the answer is yes, I do think we should do that. But you don't have to make like an obsession about it, you know? Um, I used to be obsessed with it. I really did. But I think I'm less obsessed with it. But it's a fundamental part of my curriculum is to challenge Christians' beliefs wherever I find them but because I teach, I do that in the classroom, and I provide them with the best sources, pro and con, and sort of guide them through how to think about that. And I make no secret of what my views are. I think there's no such thing as neutral. They know where I'm coming from, but at least they'll have thought through these things a few more steps than they did before. Yeah. And even though I'm, you know, I'm an academic, so, it's, so there's going to be a lot of talk of books, but it's really just more, di the books to me are just, they're fodder for dialogue. So the fundamental model here is just two-way two conversation between people who are both looking for the truth. Sometimes that involves books and sometimes it doesn't. So I texted this question, but um, I'll just ask it. I really appreciated the talk. Um, and so I think my question's a little bit more about a subset of it, but it was about certainty. Yeah, um, certainty. I think, yes, I think I'm troubled about the thought that there is no certainty. She's troubled about the thought that there's no certainty. Yes, I mean, this is probably very common. It's, and I know that that It's is, troubling in a certain way. <laughs> and I know that uh, there are problems with certainty, mm -hmm. but what I'm curious about is can't I be certain of certain things? Are there certain things that I can be certain of, like that my daughter is my daughter, for example? Can you, so... Like, is there some, and I think by certainty, I mean something down the lines of like, this is accurate to the way the world is. Like an accurate picture of the world is that I am the mom of Felicity. Yeah. Or so something like that. So the direct answer to your, I always try to give direct answers to yeah, direct sure. question. The yeah. answer is, I think, no, <laughs> there is nothing about which you can be strictly speaking certain. No, I think there are things you can be certain enough of that investigating them makes no sense. I don't think it makes any sense for you to investigate whether you're, the girl who you think is your daughter is your daughter. Mm -hmm. That can be considered settled for present purposes. But you can imagine circumstances in which you could be caused to doubt. Mm -hmm. I mean, anybody who can write a good screenplay can create a context in which subtle piece of information by subtle piece of information, you come to doubt. I was drugged that. or something, yeah. like when I yeah. gave birth, so I didn't actually... We, we've all seen movies where what certain people take for granted, is there, become problematic for them and uncertain. Can I have one follow-up question? Um, is it possible that there could be like uh, knowledge that kind of appears to us or something like that, that is, that can then be, like that you just know kind of uh, because it's like right there, like right in front so of So some people like think, that? this is a really astute question, some people think that there are some facts that we're so close to that we couldn't possibly be wrong about them. But they're all sort of weird facts that don't help us very much. So consider the proposition, I am thinking right now. Well, you might think, well, there's one you can't doubt, you know, because if I'm having the thought, I'm not thinking right now, that's a thought, and so it refutes itself, so I must be thinking right now. Maybe that's something you can be certain about. I actually think there's some technicalities there, but all of the best candidates for things that are literally certain, they, they're all inside your head. Like, some philosophers think, well, I can't be certain that there's an iPad here, but I can be certain that it seems that there's an iPad here. I can be certain that it appears that there's an iPad here. St. Augustine says this. He says, you might make me doubt somewhat that I'm eating sugar, 
but you can't make me doubt that I taste sweetness. Mm -hmm. So some people think that there are qualities of consciousness about which we cannot be mistaken because they are, as you said, so close to us. The problem is they're all inside our own consciousness and we can't, there's no infallible bridge from those to the outside world. Does that mean we should doubt the existence of the outside world just because we've watched The Matrix or what was the Leonardo DiCaprio movie where he... Inception. Conception? Inception. Yeah. Conception. Inception. <laughs> um, I'm sure there's a movie called Conception. Uh, just because we see movies like that where there's a complete disconnect between appearance and reality. And that was like, that's where philosophy started. Plato talking about appearance and reality. Just because we've all seen movies that show that there's no surefire method from getting from appearance to reality doesn't mean we should actively doubt mm -hmm. the external reality. Just like the fact that I think we could imagine a scenario in which you would come to very seriously doubt whether your daughter really is your daughter doesn't mean you should worry about it. Yeah. You shouldn't worry about it at all. But there's a difference between... See, that's a practical matter, right? Mm -hmm. That's not epistemological. Mm -hmm. So something can be quite uncertain and still not affect how you act because sometimes there's not much writing on it. So then if I'm, if I'm clear then it sounds like... So then if I'm clear then it sounds like perhaps there are things we could be certain about but they are only interior to us and as far as like the exterior world goes there's always going to be some level of uncertainty because of the yep. uh, that's, that's unbridgeable the chasm or something like that. <laughs> Alright, thank you. I, I, would, I would say with certainty when your adorable daughter looks at me she's not making eye contact She's looking at the puppy on my face. <laughs> I think that that is certain. I am certain. So, so okay. she probably wants to uh, yeah. get a hug or something. Don't forget to refill your drinks, by the way. If you're occupying a table, pay up. Great. Um, as a trained uh, social worker who happens to be a person of faith, I, am, I believe ideas are critical, but I'm also ultimately concerned with the enormous amount of suffering and pain and coming to some type of reconciliation around the issue of theodicy is just enormous to me mm -hmm. and I don't want to be stupid about that. Uh -huh. Tell me who you read relating to that issue that has some congruence with your faith story. Well, one is Richard Swinburne, because his fundamental axiom when approaching these issues is it matters more how you react in, suffering, in life than what happens to you. Swinburne's axiom in approaching these issues is what happens to you is not the bottom line. The bottom line is how you react to it. And so he sees humans as not mere victims, but as agents acting in the world and um, as part of some bigger story. And in the literary vein, that's Tolkien. So reading, we're going through uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy with the kids right now. We're in the Return of the King. And so, you know, we're in the really wearisome parts of the March to Mordor. And my youngest son's name is Sam, named after Samwise Gamgee. They probably went home by now. But that picture of the world and the role of how, how we handle suffering that happens to us in the world, is my, that's my big picture, is Tolkien. And I think Swinburne articul articulates that in a, in a way of formal philosophy. And then also Eleanor Stump artic articulates it in the context of the history of Judaism. Um, the people on earth who've suffered as much as or more than anybody. So those are my three principal, and also Marilyn Adams in her book, Horrendous Sufferings and the Goodness of God. My book on evil tries to take all those great philosophers and weave them together into one picture, as well as C.S. Lewis. I think the problem of pain is still as good as, good as anything when it comes to thinking about um, at least the theoretical problem. But Marilyn Adams... And, I mean, Tolkien provides a template for how to act in the world. 
and uh, Marilyn Adams is theorizing about evil is always in the context of her pastoral role in helping victims of suffering. Thanks for your talk. Um, among other things, I've learned why I never want to visit Northwestern uh, Missouri. <laughs> so, <clears throat> seems like at the heart of your talk, uh, at least about what you want to say about faith, uh, are two, quality, uh, two qualities you think our faith shouldn't have, that it shouldn't be absolute and that it shouldn't be arrogant. And I, I, well, I want to... It's not quite right. Okay. Th there is a respect in which it shouldn't be absolute. Okay. That's consistent with there being a respect in which it should be. So interpret that however, uh, however I should have interpreted it. Um, and I want to know how that squares with two biblical portrayals. The first one of Job, who seems to be the model of absolute faith, right? It seems like God is almost asking him to doubt, almost, you know, really putting him through the ringer, uh, testing the... Uh, the the limits of his faith and seeing if, seeing if there is anything he can do to bring this man to the breaking point. And, so, and it seems like he doesn't have a breaking point, and that's what makes his faith commendable before God. The other model, St. Uh, Paul tells us to boast in Jesus Christ. So one of the things you've commended uh, to us tonight is to be, um, have a humility in our own epistemic position. But I wonder whether, you know, faith is actually constitutive of our own epistemic condition? Or is it something that's coming from God and therefore the sort of thing that we can, in a certain sense, uh, boast about or even um, be arrogant about because of who it comes from? Well, I, I think we have very different readings of Job. I don't, I don't buy the picture that that's the setup of Job, that it's God's this big test whereby... Um, uh, God sort of tries to see where our breaking point is and like we're the, we're the victors if we don't break. Um, I think that only pays attention to the very beginning of Job and I think the very beginning of Job is just sort of this quick setup to get to the real action and I think it's limited by uh, the conceptual world of the author and the limited moral conceptual repertoire of its authors. Um, and just as Jesus has this discourse where he says, well, Moses said to you this, but I'm telling you this. Not necessarily contradicting it, but he's expanding it. And I think Job is part of the more contracted picture of, the, of, of what the Judeo-Christian moral discourse should be like. Um, and I think that the real secret of Job is... is Farther, farther in, in Job's dialogue with God, and specifically, um, not his, not his ignorance necessarily, as some people think, but in a failure to recognize um, God's power and God's providence and how God is all around all of this, and so a full answer would take us into you know a full exposition of Job. So the bottom line is I don't accept the setup. Um, I think it's more subtle than that, and I also think it's conceptually limited. I think Job is conceptually limited. I don't hold it as any kind of paradigm, personally. Um, I think when Paul says boast there, I, that seems clearly like a, a, a literary trope. He's talking ironically there. And that when you boast in what somebody else has really done through you, it's, it's not really boasting. It's like... Um, it, it's, it's, just a, it's, a, it's a way of referring back to... It's, it's unboasting, actually. It's the, it's the opposite of true boasting because you're referring it back to a source outside yourself. Um, and so I think, it, yeah, it's fine to, be, to boast in that sense, to say, God got me through this. Man, isn't God great. Um, so it's fine to... And, you know, you say a sort of arrogance. I mean, if you want to use that super ironically, then... I don't have a problem with that, but as long as we realize that it's non-literal and that there's the sort of pride is the sort of humble pride of just getting to be used, getting to be a manifestation, getting to be sort of God's, you know, tool 
I guess I want to stay true to my ideals better than I do. Uh, I think I've got a good picture of how I ought to be. Uh, I just got a, I just had a, just had a big paradigm shift, a sort of gestalt where I realized that the idea of archetype is behind a lot of my work. And so that's going to frame a lot of my future work is the idea of archetype, writing books about saintliness and saints and saint, how sainthood features into various things and how ideal rationality holds the secret to how we ought to think about epistemology. And I feel like I've got a decent glimpse of the archetype. But I feel like I'm a million miles from actually living out the ideals that I care so much about. And when you're passionate about certain ideals and fall sh so short of them, it's easy to look like a hypocrite. Mm. Um, pray that I will keep trying and that my failures will not cause me to despair. Pray for the virtue of hope. Pray for the infused divine gift of hope that will keep me from despairing over how far I fall from the ideals that I so value. Dr. Trent Doherty. Thank you to Dichotomy. Thank all of you very, very much. God bless.